My name is Ron Carrico, San Diego Air and Space Museum. Today we're interviewing uh, James Kidrick, who is the CEO of the Air and Space Museum. And after a number of years, he's finally uh, volunteered to uh, be interviewed about his military experience, particularly flying uh, the kinds of airplanes he flew. So let's start with easy. So, where were you born? Bremerton, Washington. When? Uh, July 26, 1949. And what did your parents do? Uh, my dad was uh, initially a journeyman lithographer and then entered, uh, uh, was later on an executive with a printing company, okay, and uh, when we moved from Edmonds, Washington, a suburb of Seattle, to Centralia, he came down there, he, he was sent down there to run a company called Bank Check Supply Company. It was a school teacher. And now, you, at some point, oh, where would you go to college? Uh, University of Puget Sound. So, how did you decide on the Navy? Well, I, you know, certainly we had a lot of Navy influence. You're, you know, you're born in Bremerton, Washington, kind of a Navy town. I was in the Navy. I had an uncle in the Navy, uncle in the Army, you know, the World War II crowd. Um, so I, I, uh, I had an attraction to the Naval Service. Uh, I will tell you that I'm not one of those that, uh, 12 years old, said, I've got to go fly airplanes. Uh, you know, we watched all the old war movies like everybody else did. It could have been the submarine service, uh, you know, whatever. And on campus one day, uh, uh, in comes the uh, Navy recruiter. I'm just kind of walking by. Uh, the two Navy recruiting uh, officers there that day, you know, like a Lieutenant JG and a Lieutenant or whatever, uh, one of them uh, was a senior in high school when I was a sophomore, uh, and I graduated with his brother. And so we got talking. He says, hey, you know, you ought to come up for this uh, naval aviation program. Did he have gold wings on? He did not. He was a surface line guy. Uh, but he said, hey, you know, and, and I had been influenced by a gentleman who was like a second father to me uh, who had an airplane, and so I used to be flying in a little. Oh. Cessna 170 tail dragger with a 180 conversion. Oh, cool. You know, and then my dad took up flying late in life, had about 300 hours, you know, but I only flew a couple times with him. So he, the draft was over then, right? No. So I was lottery number 303. Oh. Okay, so I was never going to be drafted. Yeah. So I went in voluntarily. And because, um, uh, you know, once you get your number, you retain it forever. The number never changes. They just start over every year at zero. Oh, really? Right. That's how the draft works. So January one, they start at zero again, and they ramp it up. But you, your number freezes with you. Well, you were almost right after women and children, weren't you? I mean, <laughs> just about. Yeah, all out war. <coughs> World War Three. So where did you go? Where did you go to pilot training? And when um, did you start? I uh, reported nine November nineteen seventy one, same year, to Pensacola, Florida. I uh, went through the commissioning program that was a movie we all are familiar with, An Officer and a Gentleman. Mm -hmm. So we did have Marine Drill Instructors. It was called Aviation Officer Candidate School. I was in class 4671. Commissioned March 31st, 72. A lot so, of different terms. Oh no, you guys, it was amazing how, you know, the terms are different. Yeah. We, we refer to a, a four airplanes together as a flight of four, and they call it something different. You know? Well, it'd be a division for us, yeah. which know, is a, or a four, you know, four yeah. plane. Yeah. But you guys would call them four ship. Four ship. Yeah. Yeah, they don't like that ship word because that means four ships. Right. <laughs> okay. So what did, what did you fly in pilot training? I flew the uh, T thirty four B Mentor okay. initially. Right. Uh, then I flew. Have the, you ever flown one since? I have. I, um, uh, I also got to fly the T-34C later on, mm -hmm. uh, which was the replacement for the B, which is a turboprop, you know, so totally different airplane. Is and air one? conditioning for right. one thing. Right. Is that the ones they fly over here at Coronado every now and then you see T-34s with turbo engines flying mm -hmm. around the pattern? That's it. So then you flew the T-4, uh, A4, or T-4, and then? The T-2. T-2. Buckeye. That's the jet. Right. And so I flew all By the three. By the way, when you talk about this, I put pictures in the, in the video. Okay. I flew all three models, the A, B, and C. And the differences were? Uh, the A was a single engine, 
the B and C were both uh, twin. Uh, the C had the T thirty eight engines in it. Mm. Uh, no yeah. burner. No burner. No burner. No. Did you didn't need it. It, uh, it had a wing that was a great performing wing. It could out climb a whole bunch of airplanes to ten thousand feet because of that wing. You know, so it had tip tanks and. Uh, you know, you, you don't forget some of these things. You know, the last part of the checklist, you know, you look out at the two wings, balls are up, caps are down. You know, the, that's right. It was fun to fly. My favorite thing to do was go out at low level. We had training buckets, they called them, you know, like 10 miles in diameter. You go sure. out, you get your side, you know, because we'd had a four ship mid air uh, one of the guys I got there. And so just go out at low level and push it up to 450 and pan it, send it, light the burner, see how high it'll go. Doing the aileron rolls. It's like, oh man, this is so cool. Well, because the T38 and the A4 had the same roll rate. 720. Enough to bang your head against a canopy pretty hard. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, you were selected for attack or fighter airplanes? Well, uh, actually, um, uh, what happened is that, uh, so I, you know, T2, I fly the T2, then I get into the TA4. Okay, so I go through advanced jet training. So uh, the A4 was what I got my wings in. So in other words, when I completed flight training, uh, I was winged September 21 of 73, which was coincidental with basically our, uh, the end of the war. We had right. stopped bombing, uh, we didn't have the attrition and all that kind of stuff. So, so what happens is, is that uh, there was only, there were like 25 or 26 of us, uh, you know, getting our wings pinned you know, and this is, remember, you have training at Meridian, Mississippi, Beeville, Texas, Kingsville, Texas, mm -hmm. and some, but not very much, in Pensacola. And so uh, there was one fleet seat for 26 people. Uh, that was like an EA-6B, because the EA-6B had just come out, and they were just selecting, really, the first nugget, the first new guy out of the training command, you know, to go up to, uh, to Whidbey. So I initially went to Miramar, okay, uh, which was a non, we, we call it a non-fleet seat, okay? Thus, I became, as a number of other people did, a NEFIA for the next set of orders, which was a non-fleet experienced aviator. You know, you're kind of categorized, so you're out of the training command. So I fly as an instructor, okay, in the instrument rag, okay, uh, doing uh, some amount also of adversary work and, uh, you know, mission specialist. So VF-126, the fighter squadron at Miramar was really, at that time, I was in it twice, was all A-4s. So, um, so, so I come up for, uh, for consideration of orders. In June of 75, okay, they offered me an F-4 Phantom or an A-7 Corsair. I got a lot of static because I was at Miramar, okay, and you know the F-14 was now out, okay, and the F-4 seat probably would have, you know, within six months been an F-14 seat, but I uh, I had a, a a really really strong desire to fly by myself, and we only had one airplane that was single seat, and that was the A-7, and I could honestly tell you I'm not even sure I'd seen an A-7 well uh, by making that selection. But I had, so I'm in VF-126, so there's only a few, matter of fact, probably two or three of us, meaning people who hadn't been in the fleet first, mm -hmm. okay, in that squadron, there's only, like I said, two or three of us. Everybody else had been in the fleet, okay, and they'd been F-8 drivers, A-4 drivers, and F-4 drivers. I was heavily influenced by the A-4, F-8 world. <coughs> the fly by yourself, mm -hmm you know, kind of thing. I remember going out on a cross country in a TA4 with an old A4 guy and, you know, I'm just, you know, young and through, hey, what can I do? Uh, you want me to handle the rate? He says, how about this? When you fly, you fly. When I fly, I fly. Never forget that as long as I live. And I understood. So, you know, when I said, I've got the aircraft, he said, you've got the aircraft. I had the airplane. Radios, nav, whatever it may have been. And later on, that proved extremely beneficial because the A7 had about a 1.7 uh, pilot workload uh, because of the systems, the mapping, the, the mission, and, 
And if you were looking as for instructors in the training command, which I did go do, uh, you know, you would love to get all the single seat guys in the world because, you know, you're training your student to be a single seat guy. You know, I mean, you remember when you went through flight training, they weren't training you to be with somebody else, they were training you to, you know, strap it on all by yourself and, and go fly. I think that we flew it when we flew, fly in F4s, I think we just did the one pilot thing. Whoever was flying the airplane did everything. Yep, yeah, see, you guys had F4s with two sticks. Yeah, but I mean, you know, you didn't talk while the other guy flew. We didn't do that. But then, like, I hated it. But the Navy, it was routine for the Rio to mm -hmm. handle the radios and right. do different things. I always found that anytime somebody was handling the radios for me, I'd like, what was that altitude he said again? You know? Yeah, yeah. Because I later. Let's yeah. talk about the A4. A4, let's see, how can I tell you? They made uh, 2,900 of them. How about that? Yeah. They made a lot of them. $800,000, that's what they cost initially. And the A7, I think, cost $18 million, I believe. Well, the A7 was a, okay, so the A4. Uh, you know, Heinemann's Hot Rod, you know, you hear all those classic names. Scooter, yeah. Yeah, Sco you know, I have a patch on a one Jaxus A4, Scooter Driver. You know, <coughs> the airplane was made for people my size. You know, if you're in that 5'5 five, five to 5'10 five, mm -hmm. world, you know, um, uh, you're going to love an A4 because it's got a small cockpit. Mm -hmm. uh, the single seat was smaller than the T. The, the rear seat on a T was bigger than the front seat. Uh -huh. um, and um, so um, uh, just a fun airplane to fly, relatively simple airplane really, very similar to an F4, you know. It just had a single radio, it had, you know, TACAN, ADF, not complicated, certainly had the AJB3, you know, the all-attitude indicator, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, is one of God's gifts to, uh, to aviation uh, because I can fly acrobatics uh, under the bag, if you want, and you know, we became very proficient at uh, at doing those kinds of things. Um, you know, you know, uh, uh, unusual attitude recovery, etc. You know, so it's you know the all attitude indicator is a, if I were um, uh, if I were designing new airplanes today, my standby gyro would be an all attitude indicator because I think that most flat panels. Are confusing to people, and they're difficult to um, uh, to recover from severe unusual attitudes. I'm talking severe. I'm talking where you're like yeah, this. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm not talking where you're at 40 degrees angle of bank in a slightly descending yeah, turn, right. and oh my God, I got to get it back up. I'm talking, you know, where you're, you know, because when we present those scenarios to students, we present them pretty severe, yeah. whether they're nose up or nose down. You know, if you present a, you know, as an instructor, uh, you know, if you present a, a user attitude nose up, you know, you're going to give it to them something like this, and the airspeed's going to be probably bleeding, you know, Rapidly. below 200. You know, we used to do zero airspeed recoveries, you know, just to demonstrate what, what a zero airspeed airplane looked like and felt like. And what is it, what does it do and why do you recover? Well, we take it up to about 80 degrees nose high, pull the power back to 80% and just hold the airplane. Okay, and you know, sooner or later it just, you know, the airspeed indicator starts coming back and, and you know, it'll, it'll, it'll start backing up on you just a little well, bit. It wouldn't, took, uh, wouldn't develop into a spin or anything? No, no, not at all. And uh, oh. especially if you worked it right, and that's why we wanted to demonstrate it, Okay, yeah, because it's it's quasi ballistic flight. Okay, and the airplane would would have a natural, you know, if you neutralize uh, neutralize controls, it would have a natural drop to it, and it's usually going to drop off on one of the two wings. Okay, and just kind of present a falling leaf, and the key, of course, is to keep it neutral. Yeah. Okay, because you don't want to pro spin it certainly, right. which is more aileron. It would anything. spin though, right? Oh yeah. And so, uh, did you ever try and go supersonic? With an A4? Yeah. Uh -huh. You tried? It, it will. Really? Oh yeah, it'll go over. Hmm. John said it would, he said it would tuck under really bad, he couldn't make it go. Yeah, that's what, uh, you know, if you're flying, you know, I mean, um, the single seat I flew was the A4F, so if you got it all stripped down and everything like that, but there wasn't a whole lot of, of reason to try to go supersonic because 
you know, as you know, most weaponry uh, can't be delivered supersonic. You know, a general purpose, mechanically fused bomb can't be, you know, that, you know, those kinds of things. So, you know, um, we did a lot of stuff at 500 knots, especially in the A7. So in a typical, uh, what, okay, what were the missions that you, okay, so you were in the training, basically a training squadron, and you were one of the instructors. Yeah, so, so basically I'm an instrument rag instructor, so somebody's coming through, they're right out of the training command. Uh, this is a, for the pilot, a nine hop syllabus for the, uh, a Rio bombardier navigator heading to Whitby or uh, to the back seat of an F-4 or an F-14, a four-hop syllabus. Uh, this is to refresh them, get them back up to speed where they feel uh, comfortable on instruments and uh, and back in an airplane. I'm talking to Cat Penny about his experience flying F-4s and A-4s in Vietnam. I was surprised. You know, they only did 30 degree dot bomb. They, they were did. more accurate. They did do 45. They, they did 30. 30. Yeah. Well. 45 is more accurate. He the, said, the difficulty is, is that the F-4 and the A-4 were not very accurate bombers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it really wasn't until the A-7 Echo, thus for the Air Force, the A-7 Delta, the yeah. D, okay, came along that, you know, uh, in Vietnam, you know, if a forward air controller asked you what airplane, he wanted an A-7 Echo, not even an A or a B, he wanted an E, because the whole weapon system, he knew you could put Weapons on target. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, other th another thing that was kind of interesting about the uh, A4 was the first airplane they had uh, buddy refueling. That's kind of cool. Uh, I didn't know it was the first one to have it. They strap a big tank underneath it. Did you ever do much of that? Not much in the A4. Lot in the A7. Okay, and now uh, and that was simply because in 126, you know, I remember I didn't take the A4 on cruise. Right. Okay. But you had to be carrier qualified on it, didn't you? Oh yeah. And where'd you do the carrier qualifications? First time Lexington in the uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. How many times? So, but you probably landed on the short strip up in here at Miramar, right? No, I did it in the training command. So I so I did all my bouncing FCLPs, field carrier landing practice, at Kingsville, Texas. So then the carrier pulls out of Pensacola, pulls over to our side of the Gulf, and. We go out and, and uh, we rendezvous. Fortunately, um, uh, I may screw up a whole lot of other elements of flying, but I land well. So, I, you know, I mean, we all know our, our basic skills. I may throw yeah. a bomb, you know, somewhere outside the state of Nevada in, <laughs> at, up at Fallon, but I'll land well for you. And I won the, uh, the bottle from the LSO in the training command. And I won the uh, Jeff Dillon Award for Care Paul Excellence. In, how many? Uh, uh, how many? How many landings did you make? Uh, at that time, qualification was. Uh, I want to think for an A4, it was uh, in the training command. The qual was like, uh, you know, two touch and goes and six day traps. So when you, so when they, but after, after you, after you're trapped and you stop, then what did you do? They taxi down below or did they put you up to a catapult and go again? They did. I understand on a really hot day an A4 fully loaded would lose like 20 knots on takeoff of a carrier. Mm -hmm. Well of course we you know we weren't flying them for the CQ phase fully loaded. Yeah. You know and that's true of all airplanes you know once you get it up near its max gross weight for for a cat shot you know in an A7 okay that was mostly going to be when you had a tanker mission. So you've got you know, tanks of fuel on board, plus the D-704 store, because remember, you're now a tanker. And so that's, you know, let the basket out, you know, the drogue and, and all that kind of stuff. So we always, in an A-7 squad, kept one of our airplanes configured as a tanker. Uh, the main tankers, of course, would come from uh, either the, later on, the S-3s, but the A-6s. You know, the, A the A-6 actually had a KA-6. They had a, a, a fully configured tanker version of the A6. Oh, wow. So it wasn't a buddy. We call that, that D704, we call it a buddy store. And um, So did you do much range work with the, uh, I, I know the A4 has two 20 millimeter cannons. Did you do much range work at all with it? Uh, some, uh, because certainly uh, we had to do it in the training command. So we had to, uh, you know, drop bombs and all that. And then as later on, remember, after I... Uh, uh, after I leave Miramar, I go to Lemoore to fly A7s. So coming. So how out long of, were you in the A4? Uh, I was there uh, 
October 73 and then moved up to Lemoore in June 75. Mm -hmm. So a year and a half. Right. So you must have had, what, about five, 600 hours in the... Yeah, I think about 700. Wow. Well, you got a lot of flying. That's good. Oh, no. It was, uh, it was great. It was gr because now also uh, uh, I was selected. Remember, I'm that Nethia guy. Okay, remember that non-fleet. So you're now up with everybody who's a Nephia, okay? You're not coming just out of the training command. So I was very fortunate. Uh, I had a lot of people, you know, supporting my effort to, you know, to get picked up for a fleet squadron, and I did. That's where I was offered the F-4 or the A-7 and chose, uh, so I've never been a little more. Did you do, do any nuclear stuff training with the A-4? No. No? Really? Wow. Well, because remember, I wasn't... When I get to Lemoore in 1975, okay, the last A4s are coming off groups. So the A4 is being phased out right in that 1975 time frame, completely. So, so I didn't have to train for the nuke mission, but I did in the A7. Okay. So now let's talk about the adversary training. How did that work? Well, you. You know, most of the adversary work that we were doing uh, was associated with um, a desire to replicate the flying characteristics of an enemy airplane. So even though the A-4, in this case, would fly a certain way, it had parameters and cornering airspeeds and all that, okay, we would try, and let's say that they wanted to see a MiG-21, you know, or a MiG-17, so we would fly the airplane like a MiG-17, turn rates, you know, things like that, which is the toughest thing to do because you're trying to be um, uh, a target to replicate what they would see, not a target that is an A-4 sky on. That makes sense? Yeah, it does, but then how would you do it? Let's see. So we already, by that you time, would, you would, we had we studied the characteristics. Of I mean, the we had some MiG-17s by that time. We did. And we had a lot of them, more than everyone ever. <laughs> you know, I interviewed Well, Jeff. I participated. We called the program. I think it was have quick. Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so in an A7, uh, and because it was all top secret, of course, at that time, it's not anymore. But I, I rendezvoused on the MiG-21 over Tonopah. Yeah. I, there I, are two of us in two A7s just to do some comparative acceleration rates and turn rates and all that kind of stuff. I had a buddy who was flying a 17 who was killed up there. There was a, uh, when I interviewed Admiral Cassidy, he was talking about that, how he had flown these adversary airplanes. They make 17, 21, 15, maybe even the 23, and I yeah. tried to get him to talk about it, he wouldn't talk about it. He says, you always tell you when things are secret, but they don't tell you when they're not secret anymore. Right. Two months later, I found a book about the whole thing. Yeah, well, that, I just happen to know that it's, that it's been out. What's, well, there's uh, over 600 American pilots flew this. Yeah, what's funny is they didn't fly a lot of hardcore adversary work. What they flew most of the time was what I just described. Let's bring you up with an airplane, let's get you to see some, you know, performance characteristics, you know, how it's going to turn rates and all that. So it wasn't as much just pure fighting it as much as demoing side by side its characteristics. Drag race, climb, that kind of stuff. Exactly. So what happened when you got up next to a MiG-21 and an A-7? Not much. It just looked like a MiG-21 and we just went through the, the wickets and... You but know, he, you know, you've got, he has a burner for one thing, which the A-7 doesn't have. Right, right. So if he'd do a zoom climb... Right, but, you know, as you know, uh, you, you know uh, there are certain airplanes that, you know, that if you enter into a slow speed fight, versus a high-speed fight, <coughs> you know, it was probably going to be tougher to fight a 17 than it was a 21 at that time. You know, because the 17 had a tighter turn radius. He's going to, you know, the MiG-21 was still kind of a lumbering airplane. His turn rate wasn't very good. Do we have a MiG-21? We do. You ever sat in it? No. I sat in the MiG-15. One day, the cockpit was open. The stick is weird. It's up here. You can't, you can't fly formation like this. You got to have your hand up in the air. It's kind of weird. No, because as you know, you want st stability points. Yeah. Right. Right. I would have changed that. Even with the throttle. 
landing on the ship. You know, the A7 was not easy to bring aboard because it had that turbo fan engine, and you know your speed brake when you drop the gear and flaps, the speed brake goes back up. Well, you wanted one more high drag device on that airplane because you know a, you know a turbine engine, you know turbojet turbo uh, prop, I mean turbo uh, fan, you know ninety percent to hundred percent it has good axle D cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, then it lessens. You know, 80 to 90, it lessens even more. But through a fan engine, okay, a, a la the A7, okay, you're down into a power range where you still got power, but it's slower to come on, slower to come off. So we used to, say we were flying the Axel D cell cycles of the engine, you know, because it never ever got to the RPM that you set before you made a correction. It seemed like you'd want to land with the speed brakes out. You would. Because that you would. didn't keep more power on. Well, you would, but it came out of the bottom of the airplane. Oh yeah. Remember the F8 and the A7 yeah. it came out of the bottom. Yeah, because it's just a short fat. By the way, the greatest speed brake ever made, eight feet long, it would come out 60 degrees. If you put it up 60 degrees, it it could. It so, would throw you for, so in formation, you only use 40 degrees. I, I, I'm always, always been really interested in air combat, you know, the dynamics of air combat. Mm -hmm. and, and Chuck and I, or Fred and I just got through reading a book about John Boyd. John Boyd. You know that name. Mm -hmm. um, and he's the guy that theoretically came off uh, with, you know, fighting in the vertical. That's not true. He didn't invent it, you know. He came up with a formula. So he became form famous for this formula and a few other things. You know, as you know, there's a, there's a lot that goes into air combat. You know, whether it's, um, you know, 1v1, 1v many, you know, air to air, or whether it's, you know, fight your way in to a target, you know, and dropping ordnance. You know, there's, you know, uh, uh, you know, there are physical characteristics of some people. In other words, being able to track something moving at a certain, you know, angle rate and speed, and you know, you know, it's the it's the old adage, you know, lose sight, lose the fight. Yeah. Uh, you know, it it always applies, and then certainly having an airplane that can do what you need it to do at the right time, you know, is absolutely critical because most airplanes aren't fighting in a supersonic, you know, regime. Not for very long. Yeah. So you want to be able to accelerate from 200 knots. To 500 knots or 600 knots right now, okay, to be able to recover or extend and get the hell out of the fight because the fight's not your way. So, talking to, uh, who was it? Oh, why don't you show us the, the, uh, the uh, A A4? Show the model to the, of the A4. Okay. In case people don't know what we're talking about, we're going to talk about it. I should have been having you hold it. Well, there it is. Uh, this is, of course, a single-seat version, okay. Uh, this would, you know, have some of the nav pack, uh, you know, as it got a little more sophisticated, because most of them don't have the hump. Right. And the hump really was, you know, came out with the A4M model. It's an A4, it is an A4M. And uh, because the Marine Corps kept flying it beyond the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when the Navy stopped flying it, when all those airplanes came off of, I think it was Hancock or Oriskany in 75, the Marines came up and took them the next day. The yeah. oh, last Marines retired in 94. Yeah, no, I believe that. Yeah. Version, so that had the 408 engine in it, uh, same engine when the Blue Angels were flying. How much thrust? 12.5, uh, probably. Okay, and then max, uh, max weight 24,500. Same bomb load as that's with fuel because that airplane, no fuel is probably ten five to eleven. Yeah, that's what it said. Right. That's interesting. Amazing, I remember. So. And the, and the uh, payload similar to a B seventeen. Yeah, not much, and that's really you know when the A seven comes along. Incredible. Um, okay, so so I head up to Lamore. Okay, so I go through, and now I'm going to fly the A7E. Remember, we also have the A7A and B models. Okay, so the E was uh, a significant uh, technology advancement for the Navy of all airplanes flying in the fleet. 
with the heads-up display, uh, projected map display system, the PMDS, uh, the IMS, uh, the whole weapon delivery system. Uh, it was really the first fighter attack airplane of any service because a two shoulder mounted sidewinders, okay, uh, you had the, it was the first airplane with the M61 Gatling gun, okay, and then all the various kinds of ordnance that you could drop. You know, we could drop walleye, you know, video guided glide bombs, uh, ERDLs, extended range data link uh, walleyes. Uh, so I could drop it. You're flying another airplane. You could steer it in. You could steer. Oh, it really? Oh, steer. how cool! I didn't know about that. Yeah, that was the extended range data link. Uh, so if you flew, had a pod, I could come in, get close to the target. I could drop and peel off, and you could fly it in the window of anything. It's all contrast. Turns your radar scope into a black and white TV. Uh, uh, actually, extremely cool. You had a little bulb up slew. Uh, if the target wasn't what you wanted, you could sweep it up. <coughs> it would lock on corners of things, contrast locking. Mm -hmm. uh, had the nuke mission, of course, so we were all nuclear weapon delivery pilots. Uh, as junior officers, we were also nuclear weapon loading officers, so we had the responsibility of heading up a loading team because before we went on cruise, um, this is any A-7 squadron, certainly, uh, we had to uh, go through an NTPI, Nuclear Technical Proficiency, inspection uh, to make sure that we could adequately and safely, you know, launch nukes. Um, in the old days, PSYOP, of course, um, uh, you know, when you actually had a planned mission. Uh, so, uh, you know, we would leave on cruise with a, a planned, debriefed, flown in the simulator, locked in the vault mission. Uh, my first mission um, on Coral Sea that, uh, that I had planned from A to Z flown and briefed and all that stuff was a target in uh, North Korea. Uh, because, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> the whole idea of the airplane with the inertial measurement system, you know, in the IMU uh, was that you would completely uh, uh, rely on nothing to navigate. This is way before GPS. Well, you had, I, I thought you had, you had INS. Yeah, uh -huh. You worked That's, pretty good. Well, no, it worked great. But, you're not depending on anything external to the airplane for that to operate. It's all internal. Well, okay, I'm, I'm missing. Okay, so on the deck, okay, we would get it either through RF radio frequency or cable. We'd be plugged into the ship's inertial nav system. So the ship's inertial nav system, while the airplane is it's platform, you know, we get, we're looking for the airplane to get a stabilized platform. On the carrier, it takes about um, uh, 17 minutes. On land, it took about 11. So, uh, so the first thing you did when you hopped in an airplane on shore was on our parking spots, we had the lat long right, right there. So we punched it in, and that's telling the airplane where it is on the earth, okay? So then the alignment of the system is going to come, the platform, okay, that's going to give you your heads-up display, it's going to give you your nav, you know, everything. And uh, uh, on the carrier, because you are moving, the ship tells the airplane where it is. So as it's getting its platform, that's why it takes longer, about 17 minutes, for the alignment to occur. See, and once the, we're waiting for that alignment light to go out, okay, to, uh, uh, to tell us that, hey, the airplane's ready for us to, uh, to take. Well, the F-4 was like that, too, except pretty rudimentary. You put it in the base location. I had Not that. pretty rudimentary, extremely rudimentary. Actually, you know, Compared to an A-7 Echo. Oh, I'm sure. But because this thing had a matching weapon system that could, you know, we had forward-looking radar ranging, okay? We had um, barrel ranging. We even had radar altimeter ranging mm. you know, as a backup. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the airplane was extremely sophisticated for its day. I don't want to tell you that it's a, you know, it's an F-35. It's not. But this is the airplane that for all the services paid. That's why the Air Force and the Air Guard for the Air Force finally said, we got to have it because it used to win your William Tell uh, competition all the time. Look at the records of the William Tell and see what airplane won it. It was the A-7D. A7D had one other function that we didn't have that I was always so envious, self-start. Mm. Almost had 3,000 pounds more than us, which would have been nice. Well, the, we had a, 
the A7E had a significant engine jump. Okay, so what was the thrust of an A7D? Uh, Air Force version, 14,500. It didn't have more. The, once we, in the A7AB, we had the 101, but once we got the, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the engine, from Rolls-Royce, we had 15,000 pounds of thrust in the, in the Echo. Uh, because we used to, uh, until they found out that it was overheating a center section of the airplane, we used to uh, have something called double, double datum. Uh, we would click double datum just before the cat shot, and it would put the engine into a capability to be over temped, okay, for up to two minutes. Okay, so as you went on the cat, you got more temp, more thrust for the, for the cat shot. So, that, um, with the A7, so you flew the A7 from when to when? Uh, I got there uh, basically in uh, June of 75 and left there um, in, I'll say, October of 78. On a carrier? Yes. What carrier? Coral Sea, sister ship to Midway. And how long were you in that? Uh, made one workup, one cruise on that. Uh, a we workup? We, our cruise that. This is the old days when we cruised about 11 months. It was brutal. Were you married then? I was. Mm. I wasn't married when I left Lamore, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Navy can be really hard oh. on oh, good heavens. relationships. 11 months. That's... So I guess they, they called the uh, A7 Slough, S-L-U-F. Is that where you got your nickname from? No. I had it before I got to Lamore oh, okay. when I was flying A4s. So why don't you show us the A7? Uh, Find out some things on the A7. What model is it to start off with? This one just is kind of a blank, but it, uh, uh, but it, you know, uh, the Echo is going to have you know where the M61 gun comes out here. Uh, great strafing gun, by the way. If you, I mean, if you really want to strafe, have an M61 Gatling. It's just there is no better gun. I mean, it's just by far. So the shoulder-mounted sidewinders, of course, uh, we would have two. Uh, normally on, on cruise, we just put one on unless we saw a necessity to put uh, both on. Did you ever fire one? Um, no. Fired a Shrike. Oh, which really? Was the anti-radiation. Oh, wow. So, they, so A7's participated in that? Oh, sure. Iron Hand mission was a prime mission for the airplane. So after Bob Arnold left the A4, then the A7s took over the duty then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a thing downstairs about Barbara, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Yeah, uh, and we called it Iron Hand, okay? And basically, in a weird sort of way, it's the wild weasel kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, where you go out hunting for, um, you know, for uh, radar systems that are on. Uh, we would call shotgun airborne, uh, so that everybody would turn their tack ends off because it could seek on different things. And, um, um, and that was just to let everybody know that one was in the air, you know, on its way. Uh, uh, the later on, of course, we had Harm, okay, which was a high-speed anti-radiation missile, uh, which was just an advanced strike with better capabilities. Once it locked on, if they turned off, it didn't matter. It knew where it was going. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the strike was a little more dependent on them keeping the radar. Did you ever shoot an active target with one? No. Well, active radar. Active radar. Right. But it was up at China Lake. Okay. So in other words, there's, it would probably hit the target, but nothing else. It wouldn't blow it up, right? Correct. Okay. Now, when you flew, okay, so you were flying, where were you, when you were on the Coral Sea, where were you actually flying? Off of which coast? Did you say Coral Sea? I'm having trouble hearing today. It's okay. West Coast. West Coast. Out of Lamore. Okay. Uh, the ship was based out of Alameda. Okay. In the Bay Area. Uh, so we would, you know, meet it, you know, during workups. You know, we'd fly out of Lamore and meet the carrier either up in Northern California or, you know, down here in SoCal. And this is where we do workups. That's why when all this marine layer stuff, people don't know how crummy. Uh, the flight conditions could be working up to go on cruise off the Southern California coast. It's a blanket, and it can make for awfully dark um, uh, after you break out, not much time before you touch down. It, uh, it goes way out to sea. 
I know. We were flying to Hawaii one time, and we went about a thousand miles up. Oh the no, side. the carrier can't escape it. So you could uh, you could be, you know, you could have a you could be out on the carrier two hundred miles right now, have a wonderful night mission. You're gonna, you know, head out to Imperial Valley, drop some ordnance, you know, whatever you're gonna do, and you come back to the ship. And now you're up in holding, you know, in Marshall for us, and you know, you punch on down, and uh, you know, you enter at anywhere from two thousand to a thousand feet. You enter the blanket, and then you break out anywhere from, you know, because we still abide by the 200 and a half, right. mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so you break out anywhere, you know, in that 200 to 800 range. Yeah, yeah. So you. So you're flying, I, you're flying an ILS approach then, right? Yeah, you have ACLS, which is an ILS at a different frequency. Uh, so we would have two. Uh, two modes that we could fly. One was uh, ACLS, which they kind of locked on your airplane. The other was uh, Spin 41. Spin 41 is probably more ILS-like, meaning it's a constantly radiated signal. You're in the window, your airplane picks it up. So we would usually fly the HUD with one and then the uh, attitude indicator with the other. It says here they had a hands-off. Uh, possibility that would link into a, a map on the INS display or something like that. You could actually land on the carrier hands off. You could. Um, did you ever do it? Uh, no. And no, anybody ever did. <laughs> Probably uh, not. Well, I'm sure they did early testing. The the difficulty with the uh, uh, you know so we had mode one, mode two, okay, uh, mode three, um, and so. You know, you could, uh, so we had auto throttles, okay? Auto throttles on a fan engine, in the situation I described earlier, they don't work very well because they're constantly trying to, to play catch up, okay? And if they start getting out of whack, okay, you're gonna have to just, you're gonna have to take it. Um, I will tell you that my, uh, my personal history was uh, I always felt that um, uh, the day I will need it is, is there wasn't any necessity for me to become good at auto throttles, okay? It was better for me to be good at me flying the airplane, whether it's the stick function, okay, because a mode one is, there's mode one, mode one alpha. So mode one is hands off to touchdown. Mode one alpha is hands off to 200 and a half. Mode two is you fly it all the way with the needles. Mode three was a talk down GCA. Remember the old, you're coming down, you're on, you're on glide pad. Right. Okay. So I, um, I didn't focus much on it, to be honest. Remember, I go back to, uh, believe it or not, I land well. Okay, so here's a guy who lands well. Like I said, I may do the other stuff, you know, throw a bomb off target I'm somewhere. I'm not sure maybe pilots ever land well. Well, oh, like um, crashing. That's just when I say land well, meaning I focused on it, I worked on it, uh, and um, uh, and I think I took it in the vein. Now, I will tell you that most Navy pilots land pretty well, okay, because we practice landing a lot, okay? I mean, FCLPs is just part of our life. You know, we're getting ready to go out on the boat, and uh, let's say the boat we're going to do in two weeks, well, you know that we're gonna, probably going to have five nights of FCLPs, you know, and we're already proficient pilots, but we're going to have five nights where we do, uh, you know, we go out for a half hour, come back in, uh, hot seat for another guy, you know, tie it out, you know, chain it down, you know, lock the things, and I hop out, another guy hops in, he goes and flies, and... Because the A7, I think I would have won six or seven nights personally. I think more than better. Well, how many? How long? When I was flying with 126 at Miramar, I remember out of the train. See, I, you know, I'm also doing duties with uh, the air station, but we had um, six POWs come to our squadron. So you you gained a perspective that was um, uh, really kind of a cool one. To, you know, because you know I went through SEER school then. You know those search and survival mm -hmm. and evasion and all that kind of stuff and uh, you know right up here in Warner Springs uh, I always say the senior chief petty officer that I worked for uh, was my joke um, senior chief was it Charlie Jim, Wallace Jim's cabin 
Well, he used to be the he used to oversee Sears School. Yeah. So the fix I know, was I know in. I know a guy named Charlie Wallace who did that for a while. Yeah. Well, the fix was in. They knew I was there. And you know, so if you say, "Have I been waterboarded?" The answer is yes, I have. You know, but I. Uh, he didn't mention that in his book. I, uh, but I evaded. Okay, I got to Freedom Village. You know, so there, I think there were three of us in our group that got all the way without being you know, captured. Um, Sears School, of course, is a pretty unique experience. I've been thrown naked into the people's pool at 28 degrees in Warner Springs. A7 was a. Um, uh, its deficiency was the engine. Pratt Whitney uh, offered it a uh, uh, 17.5 mil thrust, 25 with burner. Ooh. Oh, they put a burner in it? Would have changed the whole airplane. Oh, my. Um, because, <coughs> because when we transitioned to the Hornet, okay, the initial A model, um, the COM Optev for you know, all the reporting was in the testing, it was a great Israeli land based uh, air to ground fighter attack airplane. Uh, because a typical mission of a Hornet in the, you know, without without fuel tanks or with one tank or whatever, you know, was about a one-hour turn. Okay, uh, we actually worked uh, for a while as uh, trying to make up for the deficiency of the Hornet. Uh, we were working what they call flex deck, so the deck was open to launch and recovery every hour. Well, it exhausted the flight deck because we were based, you know, Coral Sea. With F-4s, we worked one plus 30 cycles. With the F-14, uh, with conformal tanks, we could go to 145 cycles. So a typical mission off the carrier later on, you know, when I was flying in uh, off Carl Vinson, okay, um, was about a 2.3, you know, from the time you took off, 2.3 to 2.4, you know. Hmm. And because um, the A-7, had a luxury. Okay, number one is had real strong landing gear. They, they later put the same landing gear on an S3, if you look at it. Uh, so um, uh, an A7 would carry 10,200 pounds of internal fuel. You could land for an arrested landing with 6,000 pounds. There wasn't any other airplane flying that could land proportionally. Okay, remember we're not talking the, the amount but proportionally was 60% of its fuel on board. Hmm. That meant that if we went out to Kerqual or whatever, you know, we could, you know, we could start bouncing early, okay, and we weren't going to need to be refueled, you know, on the deck or airborne hardly at all. Because, you know, when you, when you, now when you get in the rag, okay, uh, you know, the replacement air group squadron that's going to, you know, it's going to train you up to fly that, that airplane, so it's a fleet replacement squadron, um, uh, and then they're going to send you off. You're going to go out and you're going to do ten day, six night with two touch and goes, of course. Ten day, six night. So that's the first time. So the first time I landed an A7 or any airplane, you know, on the deck of a carrier at night was also the Lexington in the Gulf. We had flown from Lamore uh, down to Pensacola. And staged out of this call. So, what was your first? Now, you'd flown the A4 a lot. So, when you transitioned to the A7 first first time, single seat. So, what was it like flying the A7 for a change? Well, we flew a um, um, uh, number of simulator flights. Of course, you know we went through a you know regimen of flying the simulator, full motion and video and all that. Oh, really cool. And a um, uh, pretty elaborate simulator. And um, and then, you know, because it is single seat, you know, your first flight, the instructor is just going to fly your wing, okay? So, um, you know, we send, they send you out one day and you're going to go out and start it up, work with the line crew, you know, taxi the airplane around. This, and that's all you're going to do, you know, on that, on that first one. And then the next time you're going to go fly it. You know, I was talking to Cap, I said, well, how was it like to fly the F-4 for the first time? I went out with my back seat, or we jumped in, started off, and took off. Yeah, that was it. I mean, there was nothing pre preliminary to that. He had flown a, a, a supersonic burner <laughs> airplane before that, but yeah. I think it all the time he flew the F four, he said, "Oh, it was supersonic once." He probably had. Uh, well, you know, an F four, you know, sucked fuel like there's no tomorrow. I mean, you know, the joke uh, in the Navy is 
when an F4 goes off the cat, he's first words out of his mouth are canker posit. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and that just, I'm not saying that in a bad way, it's yeah. just, it sucked fuel, as a turbo jet. That well, with 2370s, a 600 gallon, <coughs> we could go almost three hours. Uh, right, but careful. not doing anything. Not doing anything. Just, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do, see, an A7 was just the opposite. you got to do a whole bunch of stuff, you know. I mean, uh, you know, we used to have uh, something called Indian Country, okay. Indian Country is you get back. 10 or 15 minutes early from your mission on the cycle and whatever. And it's a, you know, it's a, you know, uh, defined by radials and altitude and distance from the ship and that's Indian country. So you come in and it's, it's a free for all. Okay. It's a one V many, one V anything. And, um, you know, you just walk into that circle when an F 14 or an F four can't use burner cause they're out of gas. Yeah. Okay. Now he's a different airplane. Okay, now he's not so, yeah. because remember, he's having to use that to make up, okay, for, for uh, piloting skills in a weird sort of way, because it becomes a tool. Take the tool away, it's a different airplane, different fight. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah, well, the, F, the F4, its its capability was down low, not high. Well, because his cornering airspeed is the same as an A7, 420. I wouldn't be surprised. We did a thing he would do, it was called confidence maneuver just to see what it would do. 300 knots, put in 80 degrees of bank, light the burner, right. and do a 360 and see what happens. Right. You'd come out doing 500 on the other side. Right. And it'll pull an 8 G's all the way around the corner right. like that. Just like, oh shit. You not, not 8 G's. 8.3. That was the limit. Yeah, but, the that, idea, the idea but was, that's not the whole 360 turn. No, no, the idea was to... Because if you're pulling 8.3 G's in the 360 turn, 50% of those guys are blacked out. Right. No, the idea was to kill off the airspeed with back pressure. Got so you might pull 5, 6, 7 G's around, around the right. corner, you know, but roll out and then you look up, Jesus Christ, I've accelerated 200 knots, they've right. got that much power. Right. Oh yeah, huge wing. Yeah. And that was the point of the MiG-17 and the MiG-15, is that big damn wing. Well, the 15 though, you just, you, you take it fast. Don't get in a slow speed fight with a 15. Okay, you, you get, you, you don't fight him anything but fast because he has no hydraulically boosted controls. So you gotta get, you gotta get airflow over the wing and then it's like, it's, he's gotta put both hands on the stick to move the airplane. 17 didn't, that's why the 17 had the kills that it had. Okay, hydraulically boosted controls. He could fly faster, he could fly in the up-down range of the speed. Well, when they start figuring out how to go vertical against him, that's what that was the cure was to not turn with them is to go up and then back down again because when you're going straight down or straight up you can turn like this right well you know it you know it's the horizontal movement you know you've got to you you want to get into some sort of a vertical because you've got a greater chance of either escaping him or also you know because you know every turn you're trying to get back at it you know it's kind of like you know fights on at the merge you know when you come here you know the old if you're not uh, if you're not cheating, you're not. You know, you know, you'd like to be. You'd, you'd like to be coming by him like this, you know, where you've already got some of the turn in if you can, because it's just a game. It's like, it's like two guys on a motorboat, okay, trying to get behind each other mm -hmm. in a horizontal plane, okay, um, and so twisting it up, you know, in the vertical simply uh, changes the paradigm of the performance of the airplane, and that, and it's the airplane that can do that. Okay, it's not the pilot. He's got to have the airplane to be able to do the vertical stuff. Yeah, the power. Right. Or lightweight. Right, one of the two. Yeah, and that was the, that was the point about John Boyd. You know, fighters should be small and light. And they kind of, you know, make it his, his, uh, his concept was basically the F-16. Small light. F-16 is a stellar airplane. Uh, the way it's losing now, of course, is it doesn't have the technology, you know. And you but know, then they started garbaging it up, which he didn't like. So well, they did. Um, but it, it's the F-16 is really a uh, an A-7 Echo, okay? No, meaning it's a it's an attack airplane. It's made to go into the target. And the reason that we've had to change the airplanes is we don't have the luxury of having one airplane to protect another airplane. Mm -hmm. 
we don't have a one-to-one. -one. So on the carrier, it really hurt. So uh, uh, the F-14 was lost by its own community, meaning that uh, you know, on an F-14, because I went through their, their long course on, you know, when I was looking at, at Miramar at those days, you know, going F-14, F-4, A-7, you know, whatever it was. So I made sure that I had some schools that nobody else had gone through. So I went through the three-week, this is the F-14 course, okay? Well, you know, on the, on the throttle, okay, it has three positions for the wing. Do you know what they are? Uh, auto, land, and bomb. They never put it in bomb, okay? Bomb just locked the wings at 55 degrees because coming down the pipe, you can't have your wings starting to move in. The computer can't figure the, oh, the yeah. solution because we bombed at 45 degree dive, okay, <coughs> hit an A7, you know? You describe, know we, just describe for Fred a 45 degree dive bomb pattern. Well, um, we're gonna release at 5,000 feet, okay? AGL. So that's where, so we're going to, you know, roll in at sufficient altitude in the, uh, you know, 12 to 14,000 feet. We're, and if we're just working a pattern with, with our buddies, you know, we're going to come around, we're going to roll in, you know, you, you bring it about 135 degrees, you know, down, okay, and then you're going to, you know, put it, uh, you know, on the target. In, in, with the weapon system, uh, in the heads-up display, which is just cooler than cool, it's really the same one that the Hornet has. Okay, a lot of times you'll see the Hornet uh, where it has uh, airspeed and all this stuff. We most of the time turned that off. We, we flew it in a... But you had dive angle. You had dive angle in there. Oh yeah, we had, but that's still there. We, we, yeah, you when I that. say turned off, well, we, yeah, but that's, in the, that's in, the, in the horizontal lines. Right. Okay, you didn't turn that off. You would turn off the thing that might give you your, uh, your airspeed, okay, and your altitude because it made for a very clutter, so we could put we could hit something called declutter, okay, and it would just clean it up because you got all your weapon symbology up there. So you already have an asthma steering line, okay. So you want to line that up with the target, of course, and then and then more importantly, when you designate the uh, the target, you want to pull up the asthma steering line because that's going to be your three nine correction, okay. Uh, which remember most bombers drop short even more than long. It's going to drop shallow. shorter or long. If you were slow, uh, low angle, and high, the bomb's going to drop short. Okay, so everything that was bad for you, fast, steep, and low, the bomb's going to drop long. Okay, now the computer's going to do the, going to figure it out. Okay, the uh, the key is whether or not you've got the right kind of ranging on your airplane working right, your forward-looking radar, you know, or the barrel ranging as a, as a backup. So that's where, you know, the, the, you're telling the airplane where it's going to drop. Because you, you understand when you, when, you, uh, when you man up the airplane to do the pre-flight, you tell the computer what the weapon stores you're carrying and on what stations oh, yeah. they are. You're cool. telling the computer, like uh, XJR was, you know, mechanically fused 500-pound um, uh, GP. So it could adjust the release point then a little bit if it needed to. If you well, it, 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 it's, it now knows what it's dropping. Yeah. Okay, so it, 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 it figures, figures that into the solution. And so, um, uh, so we're going to come down. We're going to uh, uh, be at about 500 knots, 45-degree dive, okay, and at 5,000 feet AGL, okay, we're going to work on that and we may even pre-designate it. So what you have is you have an asthma steering line, you have, um, you know, you've seen the little flight path marker, mm -hmm. you know, little circle, tail, two wings. Uh, the aiming diamond is locked to the flight path marker. So it's, uh, so as you come in, wherever you put, remember, the flight path marker is instantaneous vertical velocity for the airplane, instantaneous. It's, it, it is what helps you land the airplane using the HUD also. Okay, because it's instantaneous. And because you see on a HUD, five degrees is that. On your gyro, five degrees is that. Yeah, right. Okay, so as you come in, you know, you've got this asthma steering line, you've got the diamond locked into the flight path marker, and the flight path marker is essentially at that time also aligned to the asthma steering line. 
uh, and then you come in and let's say I want to hit right here. I come in, I've rolled in and I come in and I'm going to bam, I'm going to lock it in here. And once I pickle like this, okay, I could do anything with the airplane and, and it's going to try to drop the bomb there. Okay. Yeah. Now, most of the time we flew in um, what we call norm attack, okay, and you just come in at the last minute, you just designate and pull. Now, theoretically, you could have designated, you know, 2,500 feet above that if you wanted to, and just flown to a solution, but we would just, it, it, you got a better, more accurate last minute hit on the solution, on the, on the queuing of where you wanted the bomb to drop, if you just did it and then started the pull. And then as you start pulling, you'll feel that. It's in the in the F4, I flew a lot, uh, a lot of a lot of going around around the range and dropping dive bombs and. Oh yeah. Oh God, it was like, it seemed like every day. And in the back seat, it ain't no fun. And I finally figured out that, uh, and I kind of became the unofficial instructor, because I figured out most guys they're on the base leg, and they kind of drop like this and then roll into their. And I said, no, 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 no. Gas it, pull the nose up like that, so you can actually get 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, well, like I said, 135 degrees, in, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. it over, mm -hmm. you know, then you're gonna. I should have talked to you before. Yeah, then you're gonna. But I finally figured it out. It really helped out our dive box. Yeah, well, then so you're gonna. Else. You're gonna pull it down, roll it up right. So what kind of nuke stuff did you do? I mean, now you talked about having targets in North Vietnam. Well, uh, up in Fallon, which is where we practice most right. of our nuke delivery. So stuff. how what was that, how did you fly the route? Number one and number two from the IP to the target. Well, the route, of course, is pretty much a standard low low. Right. Okay. So you have a time on target. You know, yada yada yada. I mean, just like you would normally think. What speed? Um, huh? What speed? Uh, we'll f normally fly a low level at 420 ground. Yeah. Okay. F4 thing. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, you know you're going to fly it at you know 50 to 200 feet. You know, routinely, yeah. uh, um, we we would come into the target area. Now we have because we operated a different system. Okay, is remember we have lat longs to, you know, kind of really an IP an initial point. Right. Okay, so we have we have set up uh, something that was called an auto enter update because uh, along the way, remember this nav system driven by the IMS, you know, inertial unit. Okay, you know, uh, with time, when you have this IMS operating your system, it has drift. Okay, so along a route, you'll take opportunities that if I am going over a checkpoint and I know the lat long, I would set it up for one of a flyover update, a radar update. I could do updates of several different ways. So if I knew this checkpoint was in, especially, let's say, let's say I'm 100 miles from the target, okay? And I'd love to get an update for my airplane, okay? So if I know the lat long, which I will know, I fly over the checkpoint, I've set up the flyover update, I fly over, you know, boom, flip the wing up, bam, hit it, wing back down, and I continue on. Now I've got a, uh, you know, a, a pretty darn good navigating airplane. Because remember, I'm depending on that navigation and what the navigation I'm doing personally, Okay. Presuming you got the right town. <laughs> well, two, yeah, two combined. I, Pretty easy in Nevada, not too easy in Germany. No. Because <laughs> there's towns everywhere. Right. And so, uh, so now uh, we're going to get into, uh, to do one other auto enter update, okay, that we're going to, and this one wasn't an auto, we're going to do an auto enter update. So I have an IP point that I'm going to fly over, okay, and in this auto enter update, you know, I'm going to once again hit it, bam, and the airplane, everything is going to, you can just see it kind of, you know, boom, you know, as it shifts whatever amount, just a little bit, because you've told the airplane, you are here. And the next thing you know, you're going to start getting cues for the pull-up, for the drop. Is it like the ILS thing? So? Yeah, similar. similar. Uh, you get some X's, a pull-up cue, um, and you can see, uh, you can see when your flight path marker passes it, you know, you'll get a blink and the weapon's uh, been released. And it releases at about 65 degrees nose high. We do a half Cuban 8 escape maneuver. Uh, you know, half the, Cuban 8? You mean around over this way? Do you know what a half Cuban 8 is? No. Half Cuban 8 up here, right. 45 degrees nose yeah. low, opposite direction, roll oh, the airplane yeah. upright and fly it down. We just went straight ahead. Why? 
That's where the bomb's going. No, you pull up like this, you throw the bomb, parachute comes out, and as you're getting your ass out of there, down to the down on the deck. We don't go out down the deck. These are all airburst weapons that you're dropping, that we're dropping. Same for, what bomb? Okay. Uh, uh, we had the B-43. Oh, we did too. Okay, we had the... Uh, 57. The 57 and right. the 60. Right. Yeah. 60 was pretty well. We just went like that and out. Well, let me give you a little secret then. Okay, is the reason you do the half Cuban A, okay, to go the opposite direction is you, you've spit the bomb that way, so you want to go opposite to it. And it's going up, okay. Remember, you lobbed it. As it comes over is when the parachute and all the environmental, uh, you know, that you know, because it's got to pass wickets, certain airspeed, certain altitude, certain air, before the bomb will actually activate in a high order mode. About thirteen hundred feet. Three thousand. So we would exit. I think our set are about thirteen. Okay, well, ours are three. We would exit at three. Okay, the reason we exited three, remember the opposite direction of where we just threw the bomb, is that there's something called a Y curve, okay, and at 3,000 feet, which is the height of burst, there's a gap. So the bomb goes out like this in its lethality, okay, mm -hmm. so that we're trying to fly out, okay, and take advantage of the gap. Because once it goes off, like I said, it goes out and it, and it doesn't go kind of what you and I might call 90 off as much, so we would fly out at the height of burst. That seems much smarter to me. Yeah. I had one where the chute didn't deploy. We rolled over and there was the bomb right there. Yeah, fly with it. I think I could have touched it. it was well, it's like, you oh, know, that's, like, that's, like, uh, that's like an airplane, you know, um, you know, under the scud layer, you know, dropping uh, snake eye fins, okay, with no pull up away from the airplane, the snake eyes don't open. And now the bomb is just flying with you. With you. Because you didn't, not you, they didn't, they didn't do a pull away as they dropped it. You know, golden rule with the snake eye fin is pull away from it. Don't depend on it opening because you don't know. You don't get to see it. Well, after Cuban 8 maneuver, other way, height of burst, okay, um, fast height as we can burst. go. Height of burst, I wonder why you said it at a different altitude. I don't know, we, we, cer said it was, it we certainly was didn't go to the deck. What well, was supposed to be the idea was to have the burst not hit the ground. They wanted the burst to be. Maybe we said a lower. That's an air burst weapon. Yeah, but they didn't want the burst to actually hit the ground. Yeah, you know why that is. So all the buildings survive. I don't know. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. It's dirty. Hmm? It's dirty. Oh meaning, yeah, right. That's meaning right. it basically blows nukes the, nukes the dirt and sends it all up in the air, and then you know. So you know Frank Alt. I do. And he's the guy that put together Top Gun. Yeah, but I didn't know him well. I knew Dan Pedersen very yeah, well. Dan, yeah. The first seal. So we both read his book. Yeah. yeah. And I dropped it I dropped it off to you. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I'm yeah. gonna read it and I'll give it back to you. No, 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 that's all right. They got okay. it put in the They got it at Costco, it's only twelve bucks. Well, uh, I know uh, his call sign Yank. You know, we inducted Top Gun into the Hall yes. of Fame. Yeah. And so I got Yank, who Yank was my air wing commander. Okay, so Yank's gotta be my guess is 12 to 15 years older than me, mm -hmm. okay? So, 85? Uh, yeah, so I'm a J.O., okay? And um, he was our air wing commander. Well, so he'd come over and fly with the squadron. They, you know, the air wing commander would fly with any one of the right. squadrons. But the A-7 was not an F-4. So you needed to have somebody with you that, when you said, uh, how again do I put in the, because, you know, you were doing ASCII codes, you were putting in all sorts of stuff. And an F-4 was very simplistic compared to the A-7. So was an A-6, really. An A-6 and a dive bomb couldn't hit shit. It was meant to be a night radar bomb, you know, all-weather airplane, and it just carried a shitload of bombs. But in the dive bomb mode, I was, uh, I was we were off the ship one time, and uh, we were going to do bombing under flares. Okay, you know, we drop the flares. Which sucks, by the way. You don't want to do it. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. And so... Because they go out and you can't see them. Yeah. So and, I'm, well, they go so by. I'm I flying know. wing on this guy. And I, there were three or four airplanes. Yeah. Okay, and this guy, you know, he comes in. Remember, this is a guy that's got a pilot and a bombardier navigator and all that. 
and shit, I think he lights up. It would be in trouble. <laughs> so I said, because, um, you know, yeah. needless to say, it doesn't light up the target. No. I said, how about if I drop the next set of flares? Because they dropped two in, in Paris. And, um, you know, just where I think the target is. Well, you know, I've just been flying wing over here, so I've got to reorient myself, you know, as we, because remember, once once he dropped, we started separating from each other. We're starting to pull and, and to fill the pattern. Okay, so now you've got to have some sort of, you know, pattern integrity and, and still get, you know, light up the target, you know, the real target. So. Uh, Pedersen's book, he didn't take much of the Air Force, I could tell. But, you know, well, there's no doubt that, that I'm sure you have views of the Navy. The Navy guys have views of the Air Force. Okay, they aren't necessarily bad views. I don't think Air Force pilots are bad pilots. Um, we would tell you we believe that the Air Force uh, has more rules, more, uh, you know, well, you got to watch out, you can't do this, you can't do that. They have, you know, they talk, well, we got crew rest or, you know, whatever it may be. And we probably were guided a little bit more uh, by, um, hey, if we got buddies in trouble, we don't care if we haven't slept for three days, we're getting in airplanes and sure, yeah. we're on the way. And so... Um, uh, Although having said that, I was on a rescue mission one time near Mount Whitney, and there was a downed airplane. We were, ATC called and said, hey, we got an emergency beeper going on. And I was flying towards it, and you know it's, it's a rescue airplane because they were always, the king call sign is a rescue airplane, and so I said, oh sure, we'll track it down. We did it a lot because people would take a hard landing at an airport and set off their ELT. Well, anyway, so we're flying along. I'm looking, and I see Bishop. I'm going, oh well, it's Bishop. But then loadmaster on the left side says, uh, pilot nav or load. Uh, I got a green and red light down in the snow. Oh shit! <laughs> I turn around. Coming back, I you know flew around a couple of times and tried to call the guy. Nobody answered. I figured he probably broke up his antenna or something like that. And uh, so I said, if you can hear me, turn off your lights. You know, boom, lights went out. So then I started calling a little more to see if I could get a helicopter. Sorry, uh, our guys are out of crew duty time. And it was about 11 o'clock at night. And I said, um, well, yeah, I'd can... say, well, then get the. Get him the fuck up. Yeah, you know. I, but anyway, the guy wouldn't, I couldn't talk him in any So I said, and there was a storm coming in. Winter Believe time. me, the Navy I was in, they, they'd shoot the guy. They anyway, would, the next he, one, would be a, he would be in big trouble. He said, we'll be out there first light. So then this is when I got in a little trouble. Not unusual. So I, I said, well, let's configure to drop our sled. We had a sled with radios and equipment, shit like that. Let's drop our sled. And then the engineer said, let's drop the platypus, that thing in the back with some ELT in it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we can figure we're coming around. We have to fly up the mountain, you know, so you get down low, because you're going to drop it 125 knots and a whole bunch of power going up the hill. Right. And just some turning, uh, the radio operator says, uh, uh, RCC called, they said, don't drop. I said, fuck them, turn off the radio. So we turned off the radio, made the drop, uh, configured. Flew across the range to get back home. We, were, we landed with like 4,000 pounds, about half of what you're supposed to have minimum fuel. And I was up taxiing in. They say, uh, uh, Captain Carrico, uh, call RCC. Shit. Well, we had this, they had this ops room, which had speakers all over the place and two HF radios, all this kind of shit. So we call, you know, but somebody dials the number. Sergeant so and so on the phone. Stand by. And then I hear Major so and so, Colonel so and so, General so and so. And Boy, here we go. And they said, you drop without permission. And I said, I was the on-scene commander. I made the decision. And there was this long pause, beads of sweat. <laughs> Good decision, <laughs> Major or Captain, whatever it was. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want we to. We called those veers. Oh, what? Where you would come in low, pop, pull over. Yeah, yeah. We well, called them veers. We got, because, as you know, low altitude became a tactic. Mm -hmm. You know, under radar, under this, under that. Um, you know, and it's it's still questionable. You know, you can still come in at medium altitude with a lot of missile systems, 16, 18, 20,000, you know, to avoid, you know, see and avoid, you know, uh, you know, SAM break. The key is to see the missile. Um, uh, 
and of course there's a lot of ordnance now that's delivered above 30,000 feet from level flight. It's you know GPS guided or guided by somebody else or you know if you you know well, somebody told me they you have know a, what Link 16 is. They have a par parachute bomb that they launch about 30 miles out, and it just GPS itself down right to the target. Boom. Yeah. And you go home. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is once you drop, in many cases, you're you're not going to guide it. Somebody else is going to guide it. Yeah. And um, uh, so there's lots of you know higher altitude, and 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 Link 16 is basically your computer's capability of checking into the grid. Okay. And a lot of times, if your Link 16 is not working, mm -hmm. they'll tell you to go home because they need you to be part of the grid, part of the computer. So Fred was saying, why didn't they put a burner on the A7? Um, negligence, stupidity, Pol politics. Let's face was it. Was it a Pratt engine? No, Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce. Well, the A7 was, like I said, it was a great airplane. It was. Uh, it's not as pretty as some. Okay, I'm the first guy to say it. Uh, but you know, uh, I'm in the A7 Association. You know, and they meet for breakfast at Tail like every year, and they try to get together a couple other places. Do and, the Air Force guys get together with the Navy guys? Uh, they they now have. Uh, a relationship with the Air Force A7 guys and uh, because you know why not I mean uh, if you flew the airplane and you got to fly it to its limits and you got to use all the systems that were on board you found a really really good airplane now did it have some deficiencies that I said her yes did they need to replace that engine yes I know one guy jumped out of two up because the center section was overheating you know and, and they didn't know that it was overheating as much as it was and, you know, producing an extra 500 degrees, which is frying stuff. And uh, Dave Bart but you know what, the one airplane that everybody agrees is the best flying airplane they ever flew? F-86 or SNJ. Yes. yes. Everybody agrees. All the guys have talked That it's a pilot's airplane. No, it flies them. nice. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, everybody looks for an honest airplane. And, you know, I haven't like flown the, the F-86, but everybody that... I've talked to just says it's it just flies nice. But how about you know an A4, okay, to get full pull, okay, of the elevators, we had to put in a whole bunch of nose up trim. Because remember, most airplanes now have a UHT, a unit horizontal tail. Right. So when you trim it, you move the tail. When right. you pull it, you move the tail. Right. You know, you're not you know, doing elevators. No. You know. But that's fixed. Correct. Yeah. And, and an A7 yeah. was a UHT. Yeah. Right. The whole thing moved. And the whole thing moved when you trimmed. Yeah. Yeah. You know. They lost so. 360 A4s in Vietnam. 271 were Navy, 81 Marines. And one got shot down by a MiG 17. And lost. See, an A4 would do well against a MiG 17 in just a straight old dogfight. You yeah, know, but once yeah. you got to the 408 engine, you know, the Blues flew the airplane, yeah. the A4. Probably 10 minutes into the demo, they were one to one and better. Oh. Non afterburner. Well, that gets you out of a lot of. Mm -hmm. Why did they quit using it? I, I know it replaced the F4, but I guess they wanted to go to the top line airplane, which was the F4. Well, it was just time. I mean, why did they use the F4? You know how many people they killed in the F-4? I'm sure a lot. A shitload. But it was so impressive, all that noise. Well, the F-4... Made a lot of the, noise. Hey, wait, the F-4 <laughs> Phantom is still one of the coolest looking airplanes. It looked cool taxi, because yeah. it kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, there's got to be serious things wrong with it, the wings up like this. Yeah, and, and the, the tail down There's like got to be something really well, wrong. Well, you yeah. got to put, uh, you know, boundary layer control. Yeah. And, you got to do all this weird shit to give it more lift, uh, no. and uh, which helped on the boat, by the way. It was actually very stable to land on the carrier because of BLC. Remember, mm -hmm. it's BLC on, BLC off. You know, it's basically lift to the wing, no lift to the wing, not just more power. Lift to the wing, no lift to the wing, and so. Um, but it was tough to, it was tough to tank off of a C-97, which when I got to Europe, that's all they have is C-97. C-97s. And so we'd be Little flying along orange. like this, mm -hmm. and we'd be flying like this. <laughs> yeah. You know, I get right at 230 was where the, the flaps would start to blow up. Right. Oh, Our uh -huh. standard tanking was always done at 250 knots. Tanker, 
tankies. It wasn't possible. Because you couldn't do it at 300. You couldn't do it at 97. Well, you couldn't do it at 300. Do you know why? Okay, in an A6 where the or any airplane where the buddy store or the drope comes out of the center line, mm -hmm. right. when you're 300, it, like, that's right, it trails. Tra that's right. Yeah, right here. It trails, trails up. Trails up. Yeah. And your tail yeah. now is in the jet oh, exhaust yeah. of the tanker. That make it too hard. Oh yeah. yeah. Then you oh. just got. Then you just got to. Yeah.